<laughs> Who's taking the screenshot? Oh, you're taking it? Oh, yeah, God. one more time. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thank thanks you, for Mara. reminding us. Uh, I keep forgetting. I'm telling you, we've all got to be in this together. There's so many things to remember for virtual events. If we all just help each other, then uh, we'll good. get the, we'll get it figured out. Bob, you're muted. I think you've been a busy lady today. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm like full Zoom mode. Not trying to take over. Just trying to help. Because today, two for one, right? <laughs> yeah. Gary, how many people ended up registering for today? We had over uh, 100 and... registration. Yeah, but I don't think everybody's awesome. going to show up usually. Yeah, of course um, not. Yeah, there's only eight don't. in the waiting room so far, <laughs> two minutes out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's probably had a busy day. Are you recording this one? Uh, we are recording it. Yes, okay. I think I think uh, I have the. It shows it's recording now. Is it recording? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll wait a few more minutes. I think we can start admitting people in. Uh, right. I'm gonna click admit all. This will be the first ten. Mm -hmm. We're gonna give it a few minutes for everybody to join and then we're gonna start in two minutes.
Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for another CQM event. Uh, my name is Harry Mari. I'm the Corporate uh, Outreach uh, Director for PMI GLC and the um, uh, President for CQM. We have a very good uh, program for you today and hopefully you can enjoy uh, our discussion today in regards to leads. Uh, before we start, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on our um, uh, programs in corporate outreach and the purpose of our meetings. Uh, as you know, PMI is an association of uh, different project managers, and they try to help each other and grow together in a collaborative way by making sure that they do teamwork and look at communities and look at the new innovations and have a big vision for change for, and improvement. So our uh, corporate outreach was established in 2019 with our symposium, uh, going and talking to different corporations and different um, teams in regards to our um, uh, outreach goals and mission. We teamed up with universities and we held uh, many different programs uh, in person uh, until the uh, November 19th event where we decided that it's good to create the CQM community and create uh, our uh, construction community to discover new trends and topics, exchange ideas, get involved and give feedbacks and support each other as a mentor and mentee uh, fashion in a CQM.us um, website. And then we had the pandemic and we had the COVID-19 uh, uh, making all our programs virtual. And we held several uh, events in the past uh, year and it was very successful. Uh, we had a construction track uh, for the symposium in 2020. We also are going to have our next uh, virtual symposium in April 23rd. Make sure that you and your organization and member of your organization sign up for that. It's going to be a very exciting um, uh, construction track this year. And then we celebrated the end of the year on November 20, 2020 with our first anniversary for our CQM uh, events. And we call it the Construction Quality Week. And that was the first time we held that. And you can find more information about that on constructionqualityweek.com. And most of our events are recorded and uh, is published on our YouTube channel. So if you wish to watch uh, this on the comfort of your smart uh, TV, you can subscribe to our channel and it would notify you on uh, the, the app that you have on your smart TV. And of course, you have to have the same subscription. So if you don't see it, that's probably uh, either your son or daughter has that uh, thing set up. So you need to have that account subscribed to our channel. So um, we are going global. We just had an interesting meeting uh, last week with 228 participants from all over the world as part of the PMI chapter exchange. So our CQM community is going uh, international and we are looking for volunteers to help us to expand our uh, activities. And if you are interested in uh, bringing up topics and helping us with this um, mission, please email me and we'll look into uh, getting you on, on board. You don't have to be a PMI member or you don't have to be a PMP to be a volunteer with PMI GLC. And today we have a very interesting <laughs> event. It's a joint event with USGBC Detroit region. And we are going to be talking about the lead um, and leadership in energy and environmental design. And this is part of our discussion from previous events where we discussed the uh, quality PMO, where all the project managers can work together and create the CQM program, hopefully be, uh, as one of the base philosophies that we have is being 
being sustainable in order to achieve an integrated project delivery, uh, which you can find more information on qpmo.us within that uh, discussion. So make sure that you subscribe and you register for our next event, which is going to be on inter integrated project delivery on June. So our meetings are every quarter. So this is our first for the 2021. And hopefully in June, we'll see you again for our second meeting. So to start the meeting, as um, you just saw, um, this, is, this was a short introduction to how um, we, we came to this event. Um, as you've seen in our previous events, um, we are going to have a 10 minute presentation by six different panelists on different perspectives on the topic. And hopefully during this time, you'll keep your videos and your audio muted. And uh, after uh, the discussion, we're going to have after the presentation, we're going to have the discussion panel and the Q and Q Q and A uh, session, and then uh, networking. If you wish to stay longer and do uh, some kind of mingle and uh, virtual networking with others till six thirty, so please uh, have your uh, videos and uh, microphone muted during the presentations. And if you have questions, please uh, send them through the chat box and. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through those uh, questions as the presentation is presented. And if, if we see that uh, there's not much uh, uh, questions or discussion topics, then we'll allow our presenters to go a little bit longer than 10 minutes. So make sure that you ask the questions anytime and soon. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lana. Um, and... I'm going to stop my sharing, hopefully, <laughs> if I can do it correctly. <laughs> For some reason, I can't see my Zoom window. OK, here it is. OK. Uh, so I stopped sharing. Lana, can you start uh, Zoom? Yep, I should okay. be sharing I, okay. now. Can, now can now you, I can see. Yes. Can you see yes. just my slide? Yes. OK. Great. So. Uh, let me do a little bit of introduction. Um, our partner and first panelist for the event is Lana Kors, and Lana is a regional director that directs USGBC's community operation in conjunction with local volunteer leaders by overseeing market development, strategic planning, and event management and education outreach for the East North Central region of the US. Lana brings nearly 20 years of nonprofit experience to her position. She is passionate about sustainability <coughs> and loves that she is able to promote sustainability in our region. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Lana, and thank you for organizing this event. And uh, without, without further ado, go ahead and uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Harry, and thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon into the evening. Um, we're really excited that we can pull together people just to talk about sustainability and how LEAD uh, can be a tool to help you achieve your goals. There we go. Uh, I just want to give you some background about USGBC for those of you that aren't very familiar and for those that are, maybe um, I can share some new information with you. So at the US Green Building Council, we have a strong vision of a sustainable built environment within a generation. And we are transforming the places, communities, and cities where we live, work, play, and learn. And we believe that better buildings really do equal a better life for our communities. Um, our overall mission is to transform the way buildings and communities are designed, uh, built, and then also operating and maintained, uh, hopefully to enable an environmentally and socially responsible, healthy, and prosperous environment and improve the quality of life for all. Uh, the rating system that, that we've created is LEED, and it works for all buildings at all phases of development, both from new construction through existing buildings, and it works for all building sectors. So it works from homes, hospitals, corporate headquarters, neighborhoods, schools, uh, you name it, and it, uh, the lead rating system can be adapted to be able to use for that building type. Uh, we work to transform, um, or to work towards market transformation through the built environment through the lead rating system. It is a global, regional, and local green building rating system, and it helps us, you know, really build and operate green and healthy, sustainable buildings and high-performing buildings. So it's really a key solution to current environmental challenges and a tool that helps improve human health. 
and LEAD is truly a market transformation tool. Um, it's the most widely used and, and trusted green building rating system in the world uh, for LEAD projects, or excuse me, we have LEAD projects in 176 ca um, countries and territories worldwide. And we have almost 39,000 LEAD certified commercial projects. So, you know, what are the benefits of pursuing LEED certification, you might wonder. Um, LEED certified buildings, they help save money, they consume less energy, they use less water, fewer resources, and they provide better indoor environmental quality uh, than traditional buildings. And pursuing LEED and the strategies of the rating system um, helps facilitate better product and material choices in the building and helps to drive innovation. You know, it's really important um, in our current climate too, you know, when people are starting to go back into the offices or they're already there, they're going to be demanding those healthy spaces. They want to be able to go to work where they have not only, you know, if they're working from home, uh, we've gotten used to natural daylight views and good HVAC system and healthy places. So people are not going to want to go to what we call slick buildings with bad HVAC systems or bad um, lighting or bad bad air quality. Um, you know, people are really going to be wanting those high or healthy spaces that they enjoy coming to work and they know that they're safe once they're there. So lead certified buildings, they also enjoy a lifetime of returns. They cost less to operate. Uh, they reduce energy and water bills by as much as 40%. And buildings and organizations across the globe use lead to increase the efficiency of buildings, freeing up resources that um, can be really valuable and used to create new jobs or attract and retain top talent, um, expanding operations, and also just investing in some of their emerging technologies. Uh, I kind of mentioned this before, but lead buildings provide 30 to 40% energy sa or savings on energy and water. Um, they can have a 2 to 10% increase on employee productivity and 35% less absenteeism since people <coughs> like going to work and they know that they can be productive and safe in that high performing building. There's a misconception out there that people say lead is expensive. Um, this slide here kind of demonstrates some basic things that, yes, technically the cost of creating a high performing building could be more expensive. It really depends on the types of products that you put into the building, but the return on investment for a high performing building is very high. So LEED is the roadmap to help a project team achieve their sustainability goals. And it's a very small fraction of the overall budget of a high performing building. So it's not necessarily LEED, it's that they want to put a high performing building in. Um, and there's also incentives for, to pursue high performing buildings. Uh, one of them is a PACE program, which you'll hear about a little bit later from um, one of my other colleagues, Bob. <clears throat> um, this is just a stat here from Populous, which is a USGBC member. They have been since 2008. They work on LEED certified projects all over the world, and they report that pursuing LEED has allowed them to enjoy significant payback. Um, Heather Stewart stated that their data proves that the cost of pursuing LEED adds less than 1% to the total project cost while accounting for significant water and uh, energy savings. And the president of the University of North Texas reported um, that their LEED certified uh, football stadium paid for itself within eight years. Uh, in 2011, their 31,800 seat football team uh, stadium it was the first certified sports arena in the world. And um, they, they stated, their president, um, Lane Rawlings, stated that by building in this manner, the sustainable features of the building pay for themselves through their effect, efficiencies within eight years. People ask, ask sometimes, you know, what's the actual point or purpose of certifying? You know, they'll maybe use the rating system to, you know, set as their goals but they don't actually certify. And so the simplest way to answer that is that third-party verification through LEED helps to guarantee that the building design um, is achieving the goals of the project team put into place. Same thing if it's an existing building. You can build a building however, um, with the best products and however you design it to be really efficient. But if the individuals that are occupying that building every day don't know how to use the building the best or um, aren't familiar with, you know, how to use those products. Let's say they leave the lights on all day or they open windows and have the air conditioning mm -hmm. blasting or they um, do different things like that, that, you know, they're not composting or recycling like they're supposed to. You know, if they're not using the basic building how it was intended, you're not intended, you're not going to see those return on your investment. So it's good to track and certify to be able to actually ensure that it is um, achieving the goals that you set in place. So an integrated design process, uh, which I know another um, presenter is going to get into a bit more detail, but it really is the most important aspect of a lead project. And by having all the team members together at the beginning allows the team to, uh, or to properly plan for the sustainability features and designs from the very beginning. And involving a lead accredited professional is someone that can help the project team achieve their goals by using the rating system. There's over 200,000 worldwide, and we have a lot of them living here locally. 
Um, under the banner of sustainability, instead of just reducing environmental damage, we also want to make sure we give back to the planet. With LEED Zero and LEED Positive, our vision of regenerative buildings, um, we are pushing the market to implement a new level of performance in green buildings. With the ARC technology platform that powers LEED, all buildings can track, measure, and analyze the score for, with real-world performance data. So certified projects can now earn LEED Zero certification in any of the performance categories, which are carbon, energy, waste, and water. And the future for USGBC is uh, LEED positive. So our president and CEO has set an aspirational goal for USGBC that we will require all LEED new construction projects um, to achieve LEED positive starting in 2025 and all existing buildings to be LEED positive by 2050. Um, we also have V4.1 right now. We rolled out V4 uh, version 4 about five years ago, and then we rolled out lead version 4.1 um, uh, re more recently. And this really is, you know, we're wanting to go bigger. So lead V4.1 is for all. It's more inclusive. It allows projects to earn lead points through performance building monitoring via the ARC performance platform. We want it to be stronger by continuing to drive performance. Performance outcomes are fully integrated into V4.1, so you can measure performance on an ongoing basis. We wanna be bolder. Um, our lessons learned from those in the market using LEED V4 and over the last 25 years um, have led us to take a deeper look at existing buildings, residential projects, and cities to develop unique solutions that address unique markets. So V4.1 will deliver new methodologies for measuring building performance by working with and supporting projects to track energy, water, waste, transportation, and indoor air quality. Um, a simple data-driven path to lead certification for existing buildings, V4.1 is making it accessible to more projects than any other version of the rating system. We also have updated reference standards and performance requirements to ensure that re LEED remains a global leader in green building. And project teams can also substitute LEED V4.1 credits on LEED V4 projects. And this has been really great feedback, or we've been getting really great feedback. Some project teams uh, were using V4 and were you know, having challenges meeting the requirements to get their building certified. And then once we rolled out the V4.1, they were able to substitute some of those credits and where they were struggling to even get certified before, and now they're reaching gold and platinum status. So when we put out a new uh, version of the rating system, sometimes those credits don't fully meet the intent of what they were created for. So that's why we uh, have this continuous improvement process for LEED. So we make sure that those credits are really meeting the demands and the needs of our community. Um, so our members have shaped our organization into what it is today. They are driving the entire green building community to go further faster than ever before. And we're made up of companies large and small, um, both local and multinational. So if you're not a local member um, of your local community, uh, or if your organization isn't already a member of USGBC, we would love to have your support. USGBC membership includes reduced rates um, for lead registration and certification, also for education events and many, many other benefits as well as marketing opportunities. So we welcome your support to achieve our vision, which is that of a green building community can help change our world for the better. Um, and when you join USGBC, you signal your support for the growing green building movement, as well as programs and initiatives that advance our global mission. So what are the next steps to committing to lead and integrating it in your current and future building portfolio? portfolio. Uh, through the last year, so many people were forced, like I mentioned, you know, to leave their offices and work remotely. They've gotten used to these healthy spaces. So again, you want to make sure that your building, your existing building is really going to meet the needs of the occupants that are coming back or that are already there and moving on in the future. This is where LEED can really come in and help with re-entry and will create a space where people want to go to work each day. This is where owners and facility managers will need to focus on their existing buildings to make sure they're operating and performing at their highest ability. Um, so here is, you know, a little more about the operations and maintenance. It's a stronger environmental performance leads to economic prosperity and a better quality of life and improved human health and well-being for all. So LEED V4.1 for O&M, which is operations and maintenance, supports this goal by tracking performance in energy, water, waste, transportation, indoor air quality, toxin-free environment, and occupant satisfaction. So with B4.1 O&M, an initial certification can be awarded to projects based on the implementation of sustainable operation strategies and performance score achievement in the lead online for the following areas. So some of the benefits, you know, I think we've covered some of them, but they really are demonstrating your building's commitment to sustainability and wanting to have a healthy space for your occupants. 
It's educating the occupants and visitors on how to use the proper or how to use the products in the building and the materials in the building properly so you can really achieve your sustainability goals. It's providing shared accessibility and continuity of, um, of data across the teams over time. So you're measuring and tracking. And then it's identifying policies that will reduce uh, consumption and operating costs. A way to track all of your building's operations is through the ARC platform. It's free for all buildings to use. Uh, so any building can go into ARC and start entering their data now. And that way they can start to get a score to see where their building really does um, track. So you can register your projects by here. Here's um, a little view you can see here of the ARC platform. And it helps you, you know, lead a closer look towards um, your building and then also can help you achieve lead certification if that's your ultimate goal. It allows for any project, whether a single building, community, or even an entire city to enter the platform, measure improvements and benchmark against itself and projects around it. So you can use ARC to make incremental uh, sustainability improvements to your projects and eventually achieve lead certification. Um, ARC works by calculating a performance score out of 100 based on global building data and action-oriented strategies across five categories, which is energy, water, waste, transportation, and human experience. And project owners can leverage the score to monitor and make improvements and work towards certification of their buildings. So thank you so much. That's it for me that right sounds, now. That sounds very good. Thank you very much. Appreciate the quick introduction. I know it's a lot of material and we wanted to cover in 10 minutes just as an introduction. So as we discuss the different aspects of the topic that pertains to, to project managers and special construction managers, uh, and they'll hopefully learn more as they go through the other presentations as well. And then we'll come back to you for more questions and during the discussion panel. Thank you, Lana. That's um, great. Patrick, can you share your screen? Let me see if I can get there. Okay. Um, trying to get back to that. So if you don't see it, you get to click on that uh, Zoom. Do you have uh, it? No, at the bottom it says uh, the, where the Zoom meeting uh, icon is. Maybe if you click on that, you'll get it back. I had share screen, but I'm not finding. Did you want? Did you want us to wait a little bit longer for you to find it, or go to Julie and then come back to you? Well, hang on here a second. I can. Okay. I think I can get it. Okay. While we're waiting, I'll just mention that yeah. Lana put a link to that. Um, Mm -hmm. ARC program in the chat. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. I'm here. Thanks, Julie. Mm -hmm. Okay. As uh, Patrick yeah. is uh, getting ready, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, oh, information. I... Okay. Now we can see your You screen. got it? That's okay. It. Good. Okay. So Pat has over 50 years of experience working in the construction, uh, engineering, and architectural industry. And he is also a past chairman of the U.S. Green Building Association Detroit Regional Chapter. So he is part of the Wayne State University, and he's been going through architectural school in the University of Detroit Mercy. And it is a, an honor to have Patrick as part of our panel, as he is a fellow of the Engineering Society of Detroit, and he brings a lot of experience and knowledge on surrounding the Go Green building as he worked for Ford Motor Company Go Green program. So Patrick, without further ado, please go ahead with your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I recently wrote an article for the USGBC and it talked about why I'm involved in green buildings, uh, why I was involved in that, how I got involved. And I'd like to kind of take you along that journey as part of my presentation and also give you the benefits of green buildings. So that's where we're going with this. This is something that we've seen here. 
my history on uh, efficient buildings dates back to the 60s. Um, so through the 60s to the 90s, our main drivers were cost. That means basically efficiency, energy reduction, and environmental. We were interested in clean air and water. At that time, we knew nothing about greenhouse gases or CO2. So we're working forward. The building you see in the background is a complex that I did in San Lando, Florida, which is just outside of Orlando. It was a seven, a five, and a one-story building. Incorporated uh, a lot of green things, even though it was done in 1980. For instance, we had a highly efficient water source heat pump, which let us have individual control for individual offices. Um, we also uh, were able to move energy from one side of the building to the other in the situation where one side might need heat and the other side needs cooling. You can do that without creating it on one side and disposing of the heat on the other. Uh, big generator there. Another really significant thing on there was um, the landscaping that went in, the big green areas, and the stormwater system, which took all of the water there, ran it into a detention pond, which all of the water was then uh, percolated into the ground and recharged the groundwater. So we're happy to see how that went. Continuing with some other buildings at that time, I mean, what did we do? We looked for better insulation. We looked for equipment efficiency, heat recovery in a lot of cases. We tried to minimize infiltration. Once in a while, we'd be dealing with passive solar. We tried to incorporate that and occasionally maybe even a solar hot water heater. Um, and of course, we were looking for water conservation. The building you see in the background here is the Bosch uh, facility in Farmington Hills, Michigan. It was an office and a test facility. And the pond you see out front was especially interesting. Not only was it decorative, but it also served as the stormwater detention facility and there was a fountain in the middle of it. But we took that water and we used it to cool the, uh, the test equipment and the HVAC system of the building. Then of course we used that water to irrigate uh, the landscaping around. So we made multiple use out of that. So then in 2001, something happened, something happened. Uh, Ford was involved in green design. The uh, Ford Rouge plant that you see in the background uh, was, uh, had many, many green aspects of it. Um, one of the which everybody knows is the Ford Rouge plant had the world's largest green roof. So that was quite a thing. So Ford got together and they suggested with all of their architects that they ascend, attend something called a USGBC Summit Conference in Tucson, Arizona. Um, this was the precursor to Greenbelt. And we went there, what, did, what happened? This is, shows what Greenbelt looks like today. But at the time, uh, we had about 350 people there. We learned about green buildings. We learned about USGBC. We were kind of amazed at some of the things we do and we were, Surprised that as many as 350 to 400 people attended the event. Now, if you know what Green Build is today, you see how that has grown since then. Um, we came back and we decided to establish a chapter in Detroit um, to encourage green building design and establish green education. So that's what we were going with that. Now, I took that information based on the other things I've been doing with energy and efficiency in buildings. This was really a giant step forward. Uh, in my activities moving forward. Why? Because buildings have a very significant environmental impact. They use 65% of the electricity, 36% of the total energy use, and 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. 30% of the waste output comes, 12% of the water use, and 30% of the raw materials. You know, this is all in buildings. And what you see in the background is the Renaissance Center that I had some minor involvement with when it was being built. And then of course the, uh, the river walk along the way, which I had uh, designed some of the roadway around that area. So green design is a significant positive impact, you know, of the, uh, the design and construction practices that significantly reduce the negative impact of buildings on the environment and the occupants. Now, the building you see in the background is uh, one that not only designed, but I occupied. That was a house of mine. And it was done really before LEED got into a, 
the full blown effect, this was done in about 2000, but I incorporated many of the green movements in there anyway. Um, the, uh, the house was uh, highly energy efficient with an energy efficient shell constructed of renewable materials. And it had a design facing west because that's where a water and a canal and boats were. So I wanted to get a lot of glass there, but we know that west is a big energy uh, that you'll get from, uh, from sun coming in. So I positioned the building to take advantage of some trees close by and the trees shaded it in the summer and the, but they allowed it light to come in in the winter. The, um, the also the site design um, had the extensive landscaping and a fish pond. Um, and uh, we retained water on site and used it to, to recharge the groundwater. In addition to that, we used canal water for any irrigation and supplying water to the fish pond. So we're incorporating all of that in there, even though that was not necessarily, I was not necessarily involved in LEED at the time. Now the principles of sustainable construction, the goal is to create and operate a healthy built environment based on resources, efficiency, and ecological design. Principles, many of these are what you heard Lana talk about, reduce resource consumption, reuse resources, use recyclable materials if you can, eliminate toxics, apply life cycle costing, not just the first cost, and focus on quality because it lasts longer, and of course, we're protecting nature. The building you see in the background here is a engine plant that I was responsible for that uh, was done for Chrysler at the time and uh, was in Trenton, Michigan, about 900,000 square feet of building that uh, included many green items, uh, including efficient heating and cooling and lighting. Natural light was brought into not only the offices, but the plant, you know, a uh, high efficiency uh, building shell. And there was some area there that was uh, that needed to be restored because there was some contamina contamination on the existing site, which was adjacent to another plant. This building got LEED Gold certification and was one of the first industrial buildings in the country to do so. When it opened, we had uh, the governor of the state of Michigan and the chief executive of Wayne County as part of the opening ceremonies of that. Now, green buildings are buildings that are efficient, environmentally sensitive, and cost effective. They're highly conscious of land use and site development, efficient water, wastewater, efficient energy systems, conservation, and effective use of materials, and creating a healthy place for occupants to live and work. Same building there, Chrysler in the background. So this is where USGBC came in mind. We, uh, we encourage green buildings, encourage green products. We provide education and collaboration. And of course the rating system that Lana described uh, helps us get there and define what is a green building focused on site planning, stormwater, water, wastewater, energy efficiency, conservation of materials and indoor air quality. We're using that moving forward to do buildings. So the benefits are obvious here. When you look at that with green buildings, you got energy reduction, waste reduction, water use reduction, reduced operating costs. There's a bottom line that helps you get costs down. Certainly CO2 reduction, we're all interested in reducing greenhouse gases and re re improving indoor air quality. That gives us a better living environment. Building you see here, or the, the project here in the background is one of the uh, Go Green projects for Ford Motor Company, which I was the manager of. And this happens to be an outdoor uh, parking lot and lighting, which was upgraded to LED, uh, saving a lot of energy. Matter of fact, I had one, one of my dealerships came to me and told me that the energy company came to them and they were rechecking their meters after they redid their lighting because they thought there was something wrong with them because the energy was reduced by so much. It's a, a great opportunity. So the benefits of green buildings, we have environmental, that's to reduce the impact of natural resources, certainly reducing pollution. Economic, you reduce cost. 
And here you're reducing certainly operating costs and sometimes you can even reduce first costs as Lana indicated, doesn't always have to cost you more. But definitely the idea is improving the bottom line and the social benefits, enhancing the occupant comfort and the health and maintaining the, and minimizing the strain on local infrastructures. So we're terrific, typically improving the quality of life. This is what we call the triple bottom line. You're working on all three of them. Now, green building benefits, you know, people spend 90% of their time in buildings. HVAC is 43% of US energy. Buildings account for 12% of waste generation. Now, lead projects have been diverting, you know, 80 million tons a year from landfills or even more today as more buildings go in that direction. And green buildings do have a greater building value to their owners because they're worth more. People see that and they're more efficient. As I see it, a majority of buildings going forward are likely to be green buildings. And I think they need to be. The building you see in the background here is a, is a project eight story high office building that um, I did in Tampa, Florida. Um, this one was done before LEED came into effect, had a number of uh, you know, interesting items, efficient systems, the same uh, water-based uh, heat pump system that I mentioned earlier in the other project, but had one very interesting thing. It was a tight site. We didn't have room for a detention pond. We created a very, very unusual subsurface detention pond built out of rock and filter fabric, which was underneath the parking lots. It's a very unique design. So where are we going? Better buildings, we think that's our legacy. That's what we're trying to do. Better buildings, more efficient buildings. That's where we want to go to. And protecting the environment is also our legacy. We also want to see sunsets like this for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. We're protecting it for future generations. And here's a piece of my future generations here with my wife, my daughter, and three grandsons. So we want the world to be good for them moving forward. You know, we used to say, do this because it's the right thing to do. That's still true, absolutely. But I've come to feel that right now, it's really the only thing to do. So it's the right thing to do, and it's the only thing to do. We need to do this going forward. Green buildings are the way to go. And with that, Excellent. I say thank you thank for you all of your much. effort here, and thank you for I listening. Thank you. It was great, great presentation, and thanks for that uh, personal touch there. It was very nice to see your uh, long uh, and great experience working on green buildings and the green technologies. Um, the next portion is going to be by uh, Julie. Uh, Julie Lyons is a, um, a sustainable manager for City of Royal uh, Oak. Uh, Julie, can you share your screen while I'll introduce you? And you're on mute if you can sure, unmute I'd yourself. Sure, I'd be okay. happy to. Thank okay, you. thank you. Okay. Great. So Julie Lyons and Bricker is the energy and sustainability manager for the city of Royal Oak, Michigan. Uh, and in her position, uh, she helps with the energy issues and championed the 2020 lead for city certification. Uh, she will be discussing uh, her um, perspective from an owner perspective and the work that the, she's been doing for 15 years on nonprofit and public sector. And she, her expertise is part of the Building Council Detroit chapter, and she has been a board member and a treasurer at the Heartland Regional Representative. And also she's a liaison for the 
community outreach and work groups. The interesting part is she's a Michigan Tech University graduate and she is a PMP. So that's that's a great to have a PMP discuss this uh, topic. And she has a lead AP of operation and maintenance. Without further ado, here's Julie. Go ahead, Julie. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Amari, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about lead and uh, project management and the city of Royal Oak. So uh, let's see, I will move to my next slide. So um, we're gonna cover today in my presentation, sustainability and lead for cities, which is a little bit of a departure from the lead products that you've been hearing about, which are for buildings. Uh, the lead product I'm gonna talk about is lead for cities and communities, which is a product that is uh, more comprehensive for um, a bigger picture uh, of sustainability. So USGBC's tagline is a new way, new way green, inclusive and smart cities. So um, on my agenda, I'm gonna give a little background about um, Royal Oak and uh, some of the sustainability and initiatives we have, our Lead for Cities process, the um, additional sustainability efforts that the Lead for Cities um, helped us move forward on. And then I wanted to show um, some of our actual greenhouse gas uh, inventory results and uh, talk a little bit about some opportunities and uh, potential sustainability work going forward. So. Um, here is a bit of background about the city of Royal Oak. Um, our population is about 60,000 people and our land mass is about 12 square miles. So you can see in the right hand um, map that our city is also shaped like a very cute dog. Um, you can always uh, find it on the map if you know that you're looking for a dog. Um, in general, our uh, demographics are listed here. Median income is about 74,000. Uh, median value of owner occupied unit is about 192,000. Uh, the bulk of our uh, residents fall in the age group of 25 to 54. And the bulk of our residents also fall under um, the Caucasian uh, in racial breakdown. Um, so that's just a little bit about the city to give some context for the project that we uh, worked on through LEAD. Um, existing initiatives that we have in place, uh, we touch on many of the pieces um, of sustainability, not just uh, uh, energy um, in buildings. So for carbon reduction, again, we've worked on the greenhouse gas emission inventory. In energy, we have an approved plan and I track all of our municipal buildings utility of gas and electric to understand how these buildings are working. Uh, for waste, we've had a single stream recycling program for years, uh, which works very well for our residents. In water, we have eight municipal rain gardens and bioswale installations, including the latest a large unit, which also has a detention pond, like Patrick mentioned at one of his properties, of um, 680,000 gallons of, of holding volume. Uh, about air quality, one of the things that we participated in uh, for a very long time, as you can see, is the Tree City USA. We were the first or second city in um, Michigan to start with the Tree City USA. Um, for transportation, uh, we have been installing dedicated bike lanes over the past couple of years and sharrows and traffic calming islands uh, to meet some of the goals of our non-motorized plan, which is embedded within our master plan. Oops, sorry, there we go. Okay, and then the, the last piece of initiatives is about public policy. And uh, we think this is really important also because it helps drive um, decision making in the future, it drives um, economic uh, benefits. Um, and so you can see some of the ordinances we have in place include human rights, solar and wind installation, tree replacements, permeable surfaces, etc. Uh, our current mayor has been very forward thinking about sustainability and climate actions for the last half dozen years or so, and he has signed on to a number of uh, climate agreements uh, for 
global issues and also um, national uh, sign-ons. Uh, we are a member of the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, Michigan Green Communities, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and ICLE. So that's what we have um, going on and had going on prior to our Lead for Cities work. So now we'll get talking about Lead for Cities. Uh, in May of 2019, we were we had an opportunity to apply for a USGBC Bank of America combination grant uh, to work toward the Lead for Cities version 4.1 certification. So it turned out that our um, submission earned one of the 15 spots. So we joined 14 other cities across the country um, moving forward to actually earn that certification. Um, and so just a little bit of background about the Lead for Cities and Communities. Um, this helps local leaders benchmark performance against national and global standards. Um, it helps demonstrate um, a commitment of sustainability you know, in a very comprehensive way, um, also including resilience and social equity. It helps de develop a culture of data-driven decision-making and transparency and leadership, and um, is meant to improve the standard of living and quality of life in these cities and communities. So some of the strategies organized um, in the Lead for Cities are the natural systems and ecology, transportation and land use, water efficiency, materials and resources, and quality of life. So um, performance in these categories are tracked in, in two ways. Uh, one is that uh, there are prerequisites in a few of these, and then all five have um, a certain number of credits that a city or a community can earn. So um, one of the things I would like to say, you know, as a, a PMP and working on uh, major projects, uh, this process was daunting uh, in many ways, mainly because of the prerequisites and the amount of data required. But then again, it was also extremely enlightening because of those same things, because of the prerequisites and the amount of data required. So. Uh, we're, we are thrilled to be a part of that grant and that cohort working with other communities. And we felt, um, you know, really enlightened <laughs> is, is the word that we have once we figured out about the gaps in our sustainability work and in the initiatives that we had done in the past. And we recognized that they were really piecemealed and not set up in a comprehensive way. So um, that was another benefit of being part of this Lead for Cities cohort. So one of um, what I'd like to talk to you now about is um, some of those gaps and opportunities. So one of the things we learned is that our waste stream tracking for commercial and multifamily sectors is non-existent. We have no idea how much waste is uh, going to the municipal uh, landfills from those two sectors. So it's a piece that we need to work on. Um, again, um, another opportunity would be policies for greener buildings, you know, thinking about uh, building standards, um, mandating building performance. Some other larger cities have already done this, and it's something that uh, we will probably look into. Um, we also recognize that our current boards and com commissions don't necessarily reflect the demographic makeup of our community. And that is something we would like to change. We would like to hear a diverse um, collection of voices um, so that you know the city really feels like it belongs to everyone. Um, the next to the last thing on this list, it was a really interesting piece and that was about hazard mitigation, mainly about um, a failure um, with the utility infrastructure. If we ran into a disaster where the electricity perhaps was turned off for days, you know, how would we manage that? And it turned out there were some pieces in place, but many were not in place. We had not considered them. But beyond our own small area and thinking about hazard mitigation, uh, we started thinking about who are our partners, who are who are organizations that we really need to be in touch with and make sure that they are um, on board with what we have in place and that they recognize their own gaps. And we realized a, um, a big potential partner was our local Beaumont Hospital. They have a large Royal Oak campus 
And um, so we were able to talk with them and build a relationship uh, with them. And then also the South Oakland County Water Authority, you know, just mentioning, you know, if we had a disaster, how would we all work together? How would we manage these pieces? And we have now built a relationship and have um, a commitment to talk about these things um, at least once a year. So that was a great piece. And then um, this last one about green space and parks is really interesting and I have a slide about it. Um, so I also live in Royal Oak and I was quite aware of um, the fact that we have many parks around the city. What I didn't know was this, that 98.2% of our city is within a half mile of a park. So uh, there are only two spots here, these um, uh, areas marked in yellow. These are the only places in the whole city where you would be more than half, half a mile away from one of these parks. So anyway, again, there was a lot of data to go through, many departments to um, work with, um, but at the end of all of it, it was, um, again, enlightening, and it gave a greater understanding of where we are as a city and, again, some of our gaps. So um, let's see, Lead for Cities and Community Certification that uh, was told to us in April of 2020 that we actually earned the designation, which was a thrill, of course, after all of that work, but also because we were a couple months into COVID and feeling a little unsure about what was going on. Um, for us in Royal Oak, we have had um, continuous successes with our sustainability work in 2020. And um, it started uh, with this great news in April that um, we have become the LEED certified city. And in this 4.1 version, we are the third city in the country and the first in Michigan to earn it. So that was um, a, a very nice um certification and um, award to earn. So um, the next thing is about what, what has this Lead for Cities work helped us do in terms of you know, driving additional sustainability action? And so here are a couple things. In July of 2020, we moved forward um, having a climate emergency acknowledgement resolution passed by the city commission. Uh, when that was passed, it was paired with um, tasking staff to create the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which is our first one and acts as a baseline for data driven decision making in the future. Um, we were able to finish that greenhouse gas inventory in late September and built a task force to move to the next step, which is to understand what are the carbon reduction goals that we want to have in 2030 and 2050. Um, during this time, also, we earned another grant from the state this time to do an LED retrofit in our courthouse. And um, then the last piece here is about the commission approving those carbon reduction goals for 2030 and 2050. When that resolution was passed, um, it was paired with tasking staff again to do um, uh, this time a community-wide sustainability and climate action plan. Um, that plan is due in January 2022, and that is what we're working on right now. So I wanted to just go over this greenhouse gas inventory um, a little bit because my last slide is gonna talk about some opportunities, but also because I'm kind of geeky and I really love seeing all of this data. So um, one of the things that really struck me is um, that commercial electricity makes up about one quarter of our city's entire emissions. The other thing that was really interesting to me uh, was that the third and fourth uh, sectors here, um, when you add them together because they're both residential utilities, that's about 33% of our total emissions come from the residential category. And with you know all of this data, especially these top seven, it really gives us a good idea about where we need to focus our efforts in making reductions in the future. Um, so, so one question was, what what uh, software did you guys use for this uh, information? If you know it, I mean, uh, 
I do. Well, actually, mm -hmm. it's um, yes. The software is called ClearPath. ClearPath. And oh. yeah, and the mm -hmm. software is included with the membership in ICLEI, I C L E I, which is Global Sustainability um, Organization. And when you join as a member, then the software is made available to you as well as technical assistance, which is, of course, a great help for us uh, because we have such a small uh, sustainability um, set of staff. Sure. So thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah. And um, any other, <laughs> it's good for cities and counties and townships. So um, okay. thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so when we were doing the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, one of the things I was considering is um, trying to understand the municipal operations separately. So we actually did two inventories. We did the community-wide and then we broke out municipal operations. And my intention for doing that was to make sure that we could move forward on municipal operations, uh, carbon reductions. You know, it's much easier for us to make decisions about our own buildings, about the street lights that we take care of, et cetera. And um, so I thought it would, you know, show a lot of not only that we're walking our own talk, but you know we could make a great deal of difference. And this uh, next slide is something that was shocking to me and to um, the other staff working on this. Here are the numbers for our municipal operations. Of the total emissions, the city's operations only make up 1.4%. Think of it, 1.4%. So, what it did is it made us, you know, start thinking about um, how do we go back to these very large emitter sectors and figure out how to affect change there. Okay, so um, this is my uh, quick executive summary and opportunity sheets. And I've mentioned a few of these already on the um, chart with our emissions, but again, residential energy category is about 33%, commercial energy is about 30%, and commercial electricity by itself is about 25%. So again, with our, our work with municipal operations, um, we, we can't affect that much change relative to carbon emission reductions. We certainly will go forward with energy efficiency in our buildings and our street lights and work toward renewable energy. But the opportunity I see for uh, the construction industry and the architecture industry and the engineering industry, you know, really uh, revolve around you know, the two highlighted areas that I have here. There are substantial opportunities in the residential market and the commercial market for help with energy waste reduction. You know, whether that means um, efficient remodels. Um, retrofitted upgrades, you know, there are all kinds of opportunities there. So, and, and I should say Royal Oak, you know, is a smaller city, but uh, there is an indication that many cities fall um, under the same, a similar kind of breakdown about where the emissions come from. And so that would lead me to believe that there will be substantial opportunities in many of the cities. And given that our county, Oakland County, is moving forward on sustainability also, um, stay tuned. This, so, is, this is great, actually. Okay. This is uh, why we wanted to do uh, this from the owner perspective. So other cities and other municipalities actually take this as a role model and try to do, implement the same in their cities. And also for our AEC community to find opportunities in Royal Oak, knowing that you are uh, looking for these sustainable measures in your city. That, that was great. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure that the more questions are going to come up in the discussion section. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, we have the architectural perspective. So Lara Long is going to present her screen with us and we're going to go through her presentation. Okay, I guess. Uh... Yeah, great. 
Yeah, we see. Uh, it's just if you can make it the full. Okay, great. Okay. Is that great. good? So, yes, it looks good. So, All Laura right. Long is the studio manager, one of four offices for NOR in Detroit. And she is part of the sustainable, the global sustainable committee. Uh, that is representing U.S. in that uh, um, uh, company uh, since they are operating in 14 different sectors in four countries. So it's uh, an honor to have Laura since she's also the chair of the USGBC Market Leadership Advisory Council of the Detroit region. And she has worked on multiple lead projects. And we also are uh, colleagues in Lawrence Tech University. So welcome to the mm -hmm. program, Laura. Yeah. Appreciate it for joining us. And please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. I appreciate it. And thank you very much for doing this mm -hmm. webinar and lead. It's it's greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Julie, I just have to say, I never knew that Royal Oak, uh, that the boundaries look like a, a dog. So I'll have to remember that. That, <laughs> that made me laugh. <laughs> so thank you for that. Mm. What I'd like to talk to you a little about today about today is lead. And in this case, um, lead in general, but helping you understand how a little intimidating this whole process can be, but there's a very simple way that you can make this process easier for everyone involved. As project managers, I know that you relate. I'm also a project manager and I understand uh, the difficulties when you work with a team that may not be uh, as well uh, familiar with lead. And what do you do about that? So I'm going to go uh, talk about a little some. Sorry, I'm going to talk about. It's been a rough day. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that I'd like to uh, pose to you that would allow you to make the process of lead much simpler. And it starts from the very beginning. So I'm going to talk about the integrated process, but I'd also like to talk to you at the er the very end of this presentation about the cost of lead. You know, we talk about metrics all the time. We talk about data, and people ask, well. It's so much more expensive. Well, is it really? Well, I'm gonna actually show you some test results um, and actual data that proves that it really isn't. So I'll walk you through that. So this is a lead version four checklist. This is for BD and C. And from this process, you can either achieve certification uh, through a certified, a silver, gold, or platinum rating. And that depends on out of this total score, uh, how much, how many, how many points to achieve? And there are several credits that can actually give you quite a number of credits. Energy performance is one of them. But what I'd like to do is actually talk about just one credit, just one credit. And it doesn't even really show up on this checklist. It's right there at the top. It's called the integrated process. And this one credit, if you use the process defined by USGBC um, in, in the whole process of LEED, you will solve the majority of the problems you're gonna run into in a project when you're under construction or when you're, you're trying to do construction documents. It's going to ensure that everyone included in this, this process gets a say at the table from day one. So typically, for those of you who are used to the construction process, which I think many of you are, we have the traditional process, which is very linear. But then with the integrated system, it actually becomes more of a holistic bubble. It's a whole systems approach versus that very linear, okay, we're going to go ahead and do design developments, schematic, schematic design, uh, construction documents, construction administration. And then it's going to go out and um, during that process between construction documents and construction administration, it's going to go out for bid. And usually that's when a general contractor, a construction manager comes on board. Well, that's too late, okay? There's so many decisions that a construction consultant, a manager, a general contractor can actually help in determining what are the most cost-effective cost ways to achieve lead certification. So this integrated approach is a very comprehensive uh, uh, just method that actually allows project team members to look for synergies and these these team members include the owner, the architect and engineers involved in this, but hopefully depending on the design delivery of the project, right? It could be the actual construction management company. 
and the people involved with that. So we'd like to actually bring in every possible player that we can from day one, well before schematic design, to ensure that everyone's input is involved for the very simple reason that which is 1% of a project's first cost are spent, up to 70% of the life cycle impacts are already determined. And to put that a little bit more simply, at only 1% of the completion mark of a typical project, up to 70% of all design directions have been made. That is a little scary. A lot, someone's actually writing on the screen. It's not me. <laughs> Can you guys see that? Oh, that's interesting. I think it's just a fascinating concept that all of that money is decided upon in that first 1% of completion of project. When the majority, you think, my gosh, the majority of the work is happening the rest of that 99% of the time, but it's just that very 1% that plays a very crucial part. And that's why the integrated process is so important. It ensures that everyone comes to the table at the very beginning, everything gets hashed out, all the synergies are, 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 are discussed and determined as to be what's, what's going to be the most effective way forward with the design and what's the most cost effective. So basically early involvement by all project partners is critical. That includes, like I mentioned before, the building owner, users, and actually if the staff can be involved, we've done some actually uh, some projects with the, uh, Detroit Public Schools where we actually had facility staff involved in the design of the mechanical systems, which is unheard of, it was great. Um, but the architects, engineers, the construction team, commissioning authority, and the energy modeler, both of whom uh, these last two items, if you're not familiar with them, commissioning authorities and energy modelers are used very heavily in these projects. So this process of research, analysis, and workshops, lots of discussions. This what we call an iterative cycle that, that refines the design solutions. In the best scenario, the research and workshops continue until the project systems are optimized and all reasonable synergies are identified and related strategies associated with all lead credits are documented and implemented. Typically, I don't like to read text, but I think that is so crucial. It basically defines what this one credit can do for the entire lead project moving forward. So this is a really good example of that holistic approach, which the integrated process is. This is an actual um, kind of a charrette drawing that my company did for a, a school in Scotland. And basically what this drawing does in a nutshell is it documents day lending, day lending opportunities, how we do geothermal, in this case, um, the raised plenum with heat coming up from the plenum, the ven natural ventilation, all which is crucial um, for the health and well-being of the buildings and inhabitants. But this in a nutshell defines a lot of those systems and synergies that happen at the very beginning of the project. This is why the integrated process is so, is so important. And even though this one credit is optional, you don't have to pursue this, but this one credit can set the tone for the entire lead project moving forward. I strongly encourage anyone who works on a lead project to ensure that that integrated process is done. And sometimes it can't. Maybe commissioning authority is brought in too late, the construction manager isn't brought on until the bid process. I mean, there's a whole lot of caveats that can happen in a project, but ensuring that the, the lead administrator and the architect and engineers working on a project, along with the owner's assistance and guidance, ensures that this integrated process happens from day one, and that will ensure that you have a very successful lead project. So how does this integrated process affect the return on investment of a lead project? And I wanna actually share with you some, um, some information that I gleaned from a, a, a presentation we did with USGBC recently, I was, a, I was a moderator. Daniel Overby is a lead fellow and a faculty member at Ball State University. And he was kind of tired of people coming up to him and saying, well, it costs so much money, lead is so expensive. So what he did is he actually got together um, with, Tra with Turner, sorry, and this is a shout out, um, to Harold, just had to get you out there. Um, and with actually students from Ball State University and the company that he actually works for in his day job is Browning Day. 
And they basically did an analysis of a building in Indiana. And what they found is that the lead for uh, prom project costs for basically if you cho chose to go after uh, certification as a level, that basically cost 1.36% of the project cost. With silver, it was 2.10, gold, 5.96, and then of course platinum was, was much more expensive at 14.5%. And what I mean by expensive is that, that that's just a percentage of the, the construction cost, which is rather quite high, but there's a return on your investment. So for a lead version four certified um, silver pro certified and silver project, the simple payback is under five years. So that cost of doing a lead building, you can get a return on your investment in under five years, which is unbelievable. With gold, the return on your investment is 11.2 years. And with platinum, of course, it's over 20 years. So in addition to one of the many things that you can do and one of the benefits of, of using the lead process is that you can significantly reduce uh, the global warming potential of your project, okay? Um, and in particular for this particular project, Indi Indianapolis wanted to achieve a net zero greenhouse emissions by 2050. And buildings account for 66% of Indy's community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. So basically by doing these lead projects, you can reduce, what are the odds? Um, your, your potential reduction in embodied carbon, which is something we're all focusing on now, by 14.3%. And you can reduce your uh, operational carbon, potential reduction in operational carbon. Again, it all depends on how the building is run after it becomes certified. Uh, you can reduce it by 23.5%. So what's really interesting is one of the biggest issues that we have to deal with as architects and engineers and anyone who de deals with the built environment are codes. And we can only work so we can only work as fast as the codes dictate. And one of the things I would just like to point out with this slide, which I thought was very interesting, excuse me, I just want to get some water. Who Daniel's research, the biggest obstacle to, to him was building codes and standards. You know, over time, LEED and the standard it references become more stringent, looking for greater improvements over time. But however, if codes and regulations remain stagnant, then the differential between code minimum and what certification calls for becomes even greater. So right now, as you can see from this chart, we've got LEED that's basically using, and this is, I'm referencing version 4.1 on this. It is, the standard is ASHRAE 90.1, um, 2016. And as you can see, when the study was done, um, Indiana actually was referencing 90.1 2007. Quite a difference between those two, two standards. So, you know, using following the lead process, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to be well beyond code, which lead always is. But it really impacts, it really impacts a building, whether you pursue lead or not, as to what codes the jurisdiction is following. So I just want to stress here in my, in my presentation that there are a lot of ways to achieve lead and the most holistic way to improve, to improve a building's performance is using the integrator process. While there may be extra fees and those first time costs associated with lead, when it becomes lead certified, there are many benefits, including financial ones as which is documented. Those return on investments are pretty impressive of getting your building certified. It is worth it. And of course you have always reduce energy usage, reduce carbon emissions, reduce water and um, water usage as well. So what I'd like to just leave you with is it's always wise when you're working on a lead project to ensure that you have someone who is skilled and can speak uh, Speak for the need of the integrated process. It's crucial to ensure that your buildings are the most efficiently designed. And as someone who's worked on many lead projects over, over my lifetime as an architect, with Canada's Green Building Council, as well as USGBC's um, uh, standard, it all depends on who you work with. And having a construction manager, a project manager who's involved, who knows lead and has lead experience, 
will be the most effective project and ensuring that that integrator process is followed, whether or not you even go after the credit. You know, you can, you can, you can do all the pre front, the, the, front, the front work and not go after that credit, that one credit. But if you follow the guidelines that are in, the, in, in uh, USGBC's lead manual, you'll see how effective this can be for you in the long run and improve the overall performance of your building and ensure that those first costs are achieved um, at a lower rate. And then that return on investment, which is a life cycle cost that Patrick was talking about in his presentation, will be seen and much more easily so. So the fact that you can get a certified building uh, and a silver building with a, a return on your investment in five years is proof that LEED can be an access, a successful and cost-effective way to make a, a green building. That's, that's great. Actually, that's that's the reason uh, we, we are doing the June event is that the uh, IPD or integrated project delivery is not easy. It's uh, it requires uh, great people that understand integration and working together in a team. And um, I'm glad that you brought that point up with the lead certification is that unless you have a great team that works together in an IPD fashion, you're not going to be successful. And that's one of the reasons why it's only one credit is because it's like a given. It's like you got to have it uh, uh, to be successful in that. That that was great. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate your time and your presentation. And I'm sure uh, everybody has benefited from that. Um, next, uh, we're going to have Harold Wilcox. Harold, uh, can you uh, share your screen? Thank you. So Harold is from Turner Construction, and he's a local Detroit and native Detroit native, and he also uh, does a lot of advocacy for community service. Uh, he's part of the Michigan Sustainability Manager and SPD Project Manager for Turner Construction. He's currently pursuing his MBA at Wayne State University. He's part of the USGBC Detroit region, serving as the lead for ND committees. And uh, without further ado, here's Harold and his presentation. Go Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me clear? Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, thanks for um, Dr. Amari for, um, you know, having me as a panelist today. Um, I am happy to, uh, you know, have this conversation about uh, PNP and Lee and how uh, those two um, processes um, can contribute towards successful project integration and implementation. Um, so today, um, you know, in my presentation, I'm gonna talk about the uh, Lee process and some of the PMP principles and how they tie into construction projects from a general contractor perspective. Okay. Um, so I would like to start by just, you know, uh, sharing a vision statement. Um, and this is Turner's vision statement for sustainability. Going into, you know, finding about a lead project, um, you know, you have to have like a structure, um, which is mentioned throughout the presentation today as a part of, you know, what are the successful things that contribute towards a lead project. So environmental efficiency is one of them. You know, you have to have guidelines on, you know, uh, how your pro construction projects are going to operate. And, um, you know, that's really key in regards to utilities. Uh, resiliency is another key um, to also consider um, as a general contractor working on a potential lead project. You know, how can, you know, you bring resilient expertise in construction management that can help towards, you know, uh, evaluating decisions that in impact design or cost or quality in regards to a specific lead project. And then also green building, um, you know, USGBC is all about the uh, built environment and, um, you know, uh, implementing environmental goals on every project. So, um, you know, that's one of the best practices that you know, throughout Turner's lead projects that contribute towards the success of, uh, you know, completing a successful lead project over and over. Um, the triple bottom line um, really is engraved in um, the process and the approach of how to successfully plan and execute a lead project. Um, you know, uh, Patrick mentioned this 
earlier in his presentation is, is really embedded into the integrative process and should be, you know, considered in, you know, all of the different aspects of, um, you know, planning and implementing. Um, you know, what is project management? Project management, you know, really just going over the fundamentals is knowledge, skills, tools, techniques that it's going to take you know, maybe from a general contractor in order to, you know, complete the, you know, engineering and the building and the testing and management of that specific project. Um, with the project management approach, you know, they have it broken out into different categories like uh, initiation, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling, and closeout. Um, you know, those procedures uh, from a PMP standpoint um, help facil facilitate milestones for any specific, for any type of project, um, not necessarily LEAD, but however, in this case, for the purpose of this presentation with LEAD, you know, a lot of these similar milestones are outlined in the integrative process. And, um, you know, one of the parallel opportunities here by having a PMP professional um, facilitate a lead project or engaging learning PMP principles and encouraging maybe a project manager to pursue a PMP certification could also help, you know, increase the success factor of those of this potential lead project. Um, the contractor's role, really, um, you know, I, I know this is a long list of stuff, but really, um, you know, it's really a structured list of stuff. So it's broken down similar to the, you know, primary phases of the PMP process, which is, you know, like in the design phase, early in the stages when you develop in a project charter and, you know, the design team starts to bring on those stakeholders. Um, you know, it's really important to also, you know, from the owner and the architect and engineer perspective in the design phase to consider, hey, you know, um, maybe we should bring a general contractor on board because, you know, we can help with the feasibility and discussing the execution, discussing, um, you know, what risks are out there um, as it relates to a client um, potential goals and um, the lead certification. Um, referencing, you know, if they want to do a platinum or a gold or silver certification. So just going down a few key items during the design phase, you know, the, the design team need to, you know, establish kind of key things like how much of it is going to be reused, how much of a land, square foot of a project is going to be uh, preserved, you know, uh, constructability reviews, um, setting up the integrative design process, identifying sustainable materials. Um, you know, uh, an example of sustainable materials might be if the job going to be 100 percent green board or not um, for shaft liner and regular gypsum board, um, you know, or if it's going to be 100 percent LED lights um, and light fixtures um, that might not have ballast to reduce carbon emissions like a lot of those designs. You know, uh, it's good to have a general contractor on board at that time so that you can kind of consider those th different things. Um, and those different things also help contribute towards pre construction and value engineering input. So, uh, anytime you can, you know, identify qualified, competent contractors that um, you might have a lead project for, it's always good to maybe. Um, once you have a short list of contractors that um, make the qualified bid to do a scope review and see, you know, which contractor has the best qualifications to help implement the vision of a potential lead project. Um, Pre-construction, really, it just continues on with the project management life cycle um, to, you know, further develop the scope. And then, you know, come to an agreement where you feel pretty confident with the design and the intents of the design and the sustainability goals. So in pre-construction, you develop things like the um, finalization of submittals. Uh, and then that's once you, once you get submittals, you really start bringing on 
you know, all of the additional lead team, like the commissioning agent and um, the project management um, team and the sustainability manager specifically for that team. Um, let's see. Next slide, um, continuing the contractor's role, startup and mobilization, you know, the lead plan has to be developed. Materials and resources got to be finalized, submittals approved. Um, you got to have a stormwater waste management plan, all of the fundamentals, construction and waste management plan, identify municipality diversion um, plan, uh, indoor air quality. You know, you got to have the works. And, um, you know, one of the key things that was reiterated throughout this uh, presentation is that it's, it can be a lot. And um, the project team, has to be a unique project team with people that have experience um, in, you know, doing building of projects, but you also could and should have a champion such as a lead certified professional, as well as a PNP certified professional that could help spear, you know, the project to the, from the start to the finish line. Um, so during construction, you know, you got a lot of different things that the general contractor is responsible for doing, such as uh, establishing goals, metrics, meetings, um, coordination with all of the different owners and vendors, architects, engineers, commissioning agents, and um, really everything that you implemented at construction for lead is at the point where it's being, you know, kicked off and started. So um you know, after you finish building it and, you know, you get it tested out, you go to close out where really that's when you're doing all the final commissioning and reconciling all of the different submittals and closing out any open loose ends. But also through each of these processes, um, at least with Turner, you know, we have a significant, you know, review process to where we constantly evaluate, okay, where are we at? Um, at the end of initiation phase, did we meet all our checklists for our lead project? You know, um, at design phase, did we ask all of the questions and, you know, try to engage and encourage any value engineering that might have, you know, been cost effective or a better quality for the owner or a more sustainable product? Um, you know, it's also good as a general contractor, you know, if the spec book doesn't necessarily lay out um, a specific material that has you know a, a green guard stamp um and you know one that can be a better source um you know it's definitely good to recommend that before construction on um, the life cycle um just kind of giving another uh summary of that you know it's the concept initiation phase the organizational planning phase operational execution and monitoring and controlling uh, so, so in each of these stages, it's really key to kind of have a structured system. Now, although everyone may not have experience with the project management approach, and this may be new to some owners or contractors that might be interested even in attendance at this meeting, uh, one of the unique things about the PMP approach is that, you know, most projects go through similar phases. And, you know, there can be numerous phases depending on, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the project. And then, you know, you really just take it one phase at a time. Um, four dimensions for project success um, using the PMP model would be project efficiency, you know, the impact that you have for your customers, the business impact on the organization and new opportunities for the future. The strategic management approach, the strategic management process is a process that reflects on the corporate objectives. Now, with the corporate objectives, all of those are identified by the stakeholders. And um, you know, the strategic planning is a part of what helps identify commitments and also identify risk. So you you have a good chance to minimize risk by having a strategic management plan embedded in the lead goals and objectives for a project. Um, you know, one of the uh, PNP uh, tools that, you know, uh, Turner uses um, that applies well to a lot of projects is the SWOT analysis. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. 
you know, um, and this is also in parallel to identifying the type of rigor of a project. When I say rigor, meaning like, um, you know, a low rigor project might have different variables of safety, cost, quality, schedule, and customer satisfaction, which are some of the key things that you constantly evaluate in um, the PMP process and in the lead process throughout a life cycle of a construction project. Um, you know, metrics, um, we talked about metrics briefly. Um, really, metrics help you identify your performance on a lead project. So, you know, in, in, the, in a project schedule, in the weekly or biweekly stakeholder meetings, um, you know, these are the things that you really want to discuss and evaluate, even if they are in good terms or in good standings as far as performance or integration, you um, can really just, you know, take those and, and monitor them. Um, critical path, um, schedule, you know, at the beginning of a project, you should have a critical path and also be able to identify through all of the different major phases, um, you know, what goals and objectives for the lead project should be achieved. Um, you know, what is a system? A system is basically just each phase of the project. So, you know, you got uh, the management process where you got, you, you design and you manage and you coordinate and you take those raw materials and the manufacturing and the finished products and you install them. So through all of those, you used to have kind of like a lead QA, QC person on site. And it could be a designated field staff or engineer that can kind of carry um, a checklist that, you know, through each of these processes or milestones of a project that you are in good standings and you carry, um, you know, the integrative process along with you through each of these phases of the, of the different systems and construction or operations. So resilience, um, you know, really is the human focus. You got to consider these things as the builder uh, of the lead project. Um, you got to consider worker health and safety. Um, coming out of a COVID nineteen pandemic, um, we all just kind of saw how how um, you know different um, social or economic impacts can come in and um, change things. And a perfect example that a lot of general contractors might have faced is uh, the ability to achieve waste diversion goals. Um, when COVID-19 hit um, and six feet minimum distance was required, you know, a lot of the uh, waste uh, recycling facilities or waste sorting facilities might have encountered um, abnormal circumstances to where they can't re recycle as efficient as they could because, you know, you have um, a lot of people that have to be in six feet and now you can't really execute a diverted efficient sorting waste diverting method um, as you could in a normal setting. Am I still good on recycling um, facilities um, Dr. or waste Murray, sorting uh, uh, Yeah, I think uh, the time is, is up, but uh, if you can wrap it up a little bit and then we can go to Bob uh, for his last uh, presentation, that'd be great. Thank you. Yep, uh, thank you, appreciate that. Okay. So, um, you know, I'll uh, try to wrap it up here. Um, just a few things that the contractor is considerate of, you know, job site electricity use. Um, these are ways that you can help, um, you know, increase uh, efficiency and reduce, um, you know, unnecessary electrical use on equipment, contributes towards reducing carbon emissions on a job site. Um, you know, it's a lot of opportunities to do that with LED lights, net zero trailers, hybrid cranes, battery storage, solar charging um, equipment, um, job site water use. Um, it's good to, you know, use fresh water on a job site and also have uh, different things to, you know, make sure you don't waste water on the job site outside of, you know, construction operations. Um, Job site fuel, uh, one of the most common things, you know, uh, you use a lot of equipment, but some of the opportunities with that is, you know, uh, a lot of idling. Once again, one of the common goals, if we can, is to reduce carbon emissions. 
and um you know just wrap it going towards wrapping it up uh just a few projects that turner uh completed here in the local detroit area is the chas medical building community health and service it was lead certified the pmp process definitely helped with that project um at the end of the presentation if you have any questions we can kind of uh talk about these projects a little bit more, but I'll just kind of go through them. Um, you know, I brought up the scorecard just to kind of maybe talk about some of the, you know, categories where, you know, performance excelled and some of the areas where uh, there were opportunities for improvement. Um, so I did have a few projects. The Detroit Public Safety Headquarters was another one, um, you know, a uh, lead goal project. Uh, just one key fact I'll point out about that is that, uh, you know, a uh, very unique project. Um, since it's a government building, public safety uh, building, you know, you gotta, you don't just have the owner being, you know, the um, Detroit uh, Public Safety Department, but you also got a certain integration of engineering and management like uh, Army Corps engineer uh, requirements, um, in addition to just regular construction coordination. So unique projects come with unique you know, opportunities and circumstances. So these were just a few projects that, um, you know, I wanted to kind of highlight, um, including Munger, high school, Munger up preschool through eight, another uh, lead silver project where, you know, the project management approach helped uh, carry it through certification. And, um, you know, it was a big turnout and school still is pretty active and um, still sustainable. Um, so here, you know, just wrapping it up, lead management approach, PMP management approach, step one through six is really just an example is that, you know, you should carry both of those hand to hand. And if you do that, you will have a good chance to be a success on your project. And um, that's it. Um, thank you very much. appreciate it, Harold. It was great. Um, thank you for all the information you shared with us. And I'm sure that you've spent a lot of time preparing for that presentation. I wish we had a little bit more time to discuss those specific projects. Hopefully in future programs, we'll invite you again and discuss those in more detail. Um, I don't see a lot of uh, questions that are uh, raising a discussion or any issues that we need to like have as a discussion panel. So I'd like to have Bob present his presentation in full extent. Just don't rush it into uh, the 10 minutes time. If we can do it in 15 minutes, I think we should be okay with the time and finish the program by 6.30 if there's no other questions or um, uh, concerns. Now, I know Bob had a video that he wanted me to share. So let me try to see if I can share my uh, screen. Dr. Amari? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, we've got it embedded, so we're all set to go. Oh, and, okay, uh, good. Okay, so you want to share your, your uh, uh, screen? Definitely can do that. I just wanted okay. to thank you, too, for sure. all your assistance in uh, getting this uh, together. Thank you. Uh, I know there's a lot of work involved, so uh, the presenters and I really appreciate it. Thank you. appreciate it. Can you see my screen? Yes, now we can see it. Are you sure? That's the last one, though. It's the last one? No. Mm, just like I told you. Where? All on. right, let me get to the front. Mm -hmm. Second. You could have uh, just, just go shared with, it. Yeah, if you shared the same. Start. Yeah, just uh, went over the first slide. We should have been fine. Okay, thank you. Now, um, now we see it. Yes. Great. Go ahead. You, I don't know if you want to introduce me. You want to introduce yeah, myself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can introduce yourself. Go ahead. I think you, you can do a better job of introducing yourself. <laughs> thank you very <laughs> yes. much. My name is Bob Matler, commercial real estate uh, attorney and broker by trade. Uh, last 10 years, the green light went on and uh, obtained my lead certification with the lead AP, B, D, and C, and uh, was very involved with USGBC on their board for many years. And um, 
have since been involved with the uh, Green Task Force, the city of Detroit, and also uh, been involved with uh, Detroit 2030 District. Uh, my passion obviously is uh, helping building owners and developers um, finance all these great projects. So um, obviously uh, we've had a lot of great presentations on LEED and projects and all the things that go into it, but we've got to have the capital, we need the green financing to make this happen. And uh, PACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. We're bringing the green financing to the table. So uh, let's go to the, um, the next slide. Uh, we're gonna do a three minute presentation, Dr. Amari, and then we're gonna have some slides. We'll finish off with some case studies. And I'm gonna try and do this in 10 minutes or less because I've practiced <laughs> and I know that you wanted me to keep it brief. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. Well, here's a three minute uh, video. Mm, thanks. Ten years ago, we created Pace Financing to give homeowners an innovative and affordable way to make their homes more efficient, more comfortable, and more secure. Today, Pace is available to business owners and homeowners in thousands of communities all across the country. PACE has taken off across America because it's building bridges between consumers, lenders, American businesses, and state and local governments. PACE is simply a voluntary way of financing energy efficiency improvements for those individuals and businesses that want to become more energy efficient but lack the upfront capital to make those improvements right away. Commercial PACE has helped over a thousand building owners across the country access capital to upgrade their facilities. As an industry, we've mobilized more than $540 million, making schools, nonprofits, offices, and manufacturers safer and more efficient. We've got commercial PACE programs operating in 20 states plus DC, residential programs in three states, and we're adding more programs all the time. PACE is the type of policy that can help revitalize the American economy. PACE financing creates jobs, saves energy, decreases pollution, and reduces costs for homeowners and businesses. We've created 42,000 American jobs and financed nearly $5 billion in projects. We've helped fuel the energy revolution that's enabling people to produce their own clean energy. Solar really pays off for homeowners and commercial properties. PACE makes it easier for them to put solar panels on their roof so they can start saving now. The PACE industry has earned the trust of 180,000 homeowners giving them the power to conserve energy, to save water, and to live more comfortably. More than two million Americans go to work every day manufacturing, selling, and installing products that deliver energy efficiency. We're providing good paying jobs, manufacturing top quality products, and most importantly, they're made in the USA. PACE has helped us grow our business and employ more people. So I think that's a win-win for everybody. PACE financing is an innovative way for our uh, aging population to control their energy costs while on a fixed income. When it's 10 degrees outside in the middle of winter and your furnace goes out, you need to get it fixed right now. It's an emergency for that family. That's why we do this. That's what PACE is for. PACE is for the homeowner in Modesto who wants to run a more efficient AC without having to worry too much about their bills. PACE is for the insulation manufacturer and contractor in Georgia who wants to grow and hire more people. PACE is for the farmer from Durango who wants to make an upgrade. PACE is for the Florida homeowner who needs storm windows and doors for their peace of mind. PACE is for the local manufacturer in Bethel, Connecticut who is looking to cut his energy costs so he could stay competitive. PACE is an American innovation, and the best is yet to come. Great, so um, that's a, a couple year old um, video that I wanted to show that gives uh, a little bit of a 360 degree overview of uh, PACE. PACE is uh, basically nothing more than a uh, state law and uh, PACE again stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. Uh, we've had it here in Michigan for about uh, 10 years. And uh, PACE is a state law that I said for helping building owners and developers incorporate more sustainable building systems into their projects. Developers are also using PACE to lower their cost of capital. Why PACE? I think we've kind of gone over this. Um, property Assessed Clean Energy provides the financing 
to do those lead projects so we can save energy, save water, put in renewables, and PACE is uh, just the means enabled to do so. Um, and I should say the PACE is now in uh, 37 states, active in 25, and the PACE residential program is in four states, California, Missouri, Ohio, and Florida. PACE is great because it reduces operating costs, increases the building value, and it creates healthier, safer, more comfortable buildings. Again, no different than what we're trying to do with uh, lead projects and lead buildings, and this is the green financing to pay for it all. Some more PACE benefits include 100% financing of both the hard and soft costs. So if you have some demo or you've got engineering or architectural fees, those can also be included so the owner doesn't have to come out of pocket. PACE is basically based on the term of what we're putting in into the building. So if you've got a 25 year roof, we can do a 25 year term. If we have multiple projects, we take an average, but uh, our state law allows up to 25 years of uh, payback for the PACE financing. And most importantly, in my mind on this um, slide is that there is no owner guarantee. Uh, one proviso is if you've got a new project, uh, there might be an owner guarantee during construction, but it melts away uh, after the project is done. And that's really key, especially for nonprofits, because you don't want a nonprofit board to have personal liability and PACE avoids all of that uh, messiness, let's say, um, by not having owner guarantees for this type of financing. So what kind of assets are involved with PACE financing? Um, in a nutshell, all of them. Uh, the only projects that we can't do in Michigan, as I already mentioned, are residential projects. So anything of four units or less is not a PACE viable project. And because PACE is a property tax assessment, government buildings are not allowed to use PACE. However, the reversal, um, we have a case study of this. We had a state agency here in Michigan that was leasing a building from an owner and that was per perfectly fine because the owner was a private individual. Um, the government was able to uh, obtain uh, less uh, energy and water use and uh, use the PACE financing for their needs because it was a triple net lease. So they were paying all those expenses. But um, in parentheses, you see the names of all the different projects that have been done in Michigan on all these different asset classes. The only one that we don't have right now is agricultural. So if somebody knows uh, Blake Cider Mill or uh, a nice wine vineyard uh, up north, I'd love to have a crack at that. But yeah, PACE is great for nonprofits, senior centers, multifamily, hospitality, hospitals. Uh, it's pretty much a very broad tool to bring the financing for either upgrading that building or developing it. So we talked about uh, some of the other qualifiers. PACE can be used for new development. And again, we did that at 830 Henry in Ann Arbor, a multifamily $10 million project where we brought about $2.3 million of PACE financing. It can be used for redevelopment, infrastructure replacement. We did that at Detroit Unity Church when they needed a new roof, they needed windows, they needed LED lighting and some other building tucking. Uh, anything that relates to energy or water is a viable PACE project. So we were able to shore up the uh, drafts in that building and uh, make it more comfortable and uh, more visible to the, uh, to the members. Most importantly is this fourth bullet point, which hardly anybody is aware of, but our statute allows for you to refinance with PACE. So if you're a building owner and you put out your hard earned money to do a boiler, roof, windows, uh, LED lighting two years ago, you can now come back and refinance that project, pull out all that equity to pay for more important needs in a boiler, chiller, or a roof. And uh, we've got a, a case study that uh, we've already done a couple of those. Uh, PACE qualified infrastructure, there's really three buckets. One is energy efficiency. And I explain again, anything inside or outside the building that touches on your energy is a PACE viable project. So if you think about um, multifamily appliances, because those stay with the building owner, that's a PACE project as long as it's above code. And that goes for all this. It has to be above building code. Um, as far as outside, if you want to do your parking lights or you want to do a, a garden, a green garden in your uh, impervial space, you can do that with PACE financing. Same thing with water efficiency. Um, 
basically anything touching water inside or outside the building, where we can show that we're above building code is a viable project. And then all renewables are PACE viable projects, including EV charging stations, PV, solar, wind, et cetera. Now we in Michigan are lucky. We have two different types of uh, programs here. We have PACE Express. That's for the building owner that has a smaller type project. Could be 100,000, 125,000. Um, the, the basement of the floor is usually 100,000, 125,000. And the PACE Express project goes up to $250,000 of improvements. And uh, that can be, again, for any of the things we talked about, energy, water, or renewable. And uh, it's a little bit easier, quicker, and less burdensome to the owner because there's a lot less paperwork. From $250,000 and up, and there is no ceiling, there's been PACE projects across the country, 60, 70, $100 million. So there is no ceiling on a PACE project. Um, but um, PACE here in Michigan starts at $250,000 and up. And there we have a little bit more requirements. We need an ASHRAE level two energy. We need the savings to investment ratio uh, to be greater than one. In other words, over those 25 years, we have to show, we have to pencil out that the owner is going to save more on this project in energy and water saved than they're going to spend um, for that period of time. Uh, the stakeholders uh, in a PACE project, uh, that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. I'm showing three, but here in Michigan, there's really four. We have the property owner uh, that has the building or the developer. We have the PACE capital provider bringing the green financing to the project or the development. We have the locality where the property is. So it can be a city, a city can opt into PACE or a county can opt into PACE. So we have the locality where um, it's gonna be on the tax rolls because it is a first property tax lien. And then we also have Lean and Green Michigan, our PACE administrator, which I have a slide on coming. Here's our Michigan PACE market. And this is a little bit dated. I think we've had some growth since then. Um, since the slide was put out by Lean and Green Michigan, but we've got over 71% of the state's population now in uh, PACE enabled cities and counties. And we also uh, are having more every month. And it's a fairly easy um, process for a city or county to opt in. It's usually started by a developer or a building owner who wants to use this great financing tool. They go to the economic development uh, department and then the city starts getting involved with Lean and Green, but it literally can be 30 days, two resolutions and a hearing at the city or county level. Of course, it can also be Grand Rapids, which took five years. So, you know, take your money and pay your choice. Um, I talked about our PACE administrator, Lean and Green. Some states have several, we only have one. They started it back in 2010, 2011. Andy Levin, who's now a congressman, is the one that started this. And um, they basically are coordinating the PACE market they're ensuring compliance with the law and they are basically the go-to resource for all things PACE. And I wanted to show you real quickly their um, website. Um, if you go to their website, which is basically just uh, leanandgreenmi.com, I'm happy to share this with anybody. And you click on resources, market data, you can see all the projects that have been done in Michigan. And this is only over the last three or four years. So PACE took a long time to get going a lot of it had to do with our depression or recession, whatever you wanna call it in the early 20 teens. And since 2016, it's been coming on more and more. But if you look at all the money that the owners were saving over $163 million from these projects, and we've only done 38 projects. So, I mean, in my estimation, we've only scratched the surface with PACE, uh, but already $1 million in PACE projects. But you can see, see the kilowatts save, the CO2 savings, the, the gallons of water, you know, quarter billion gallons of water saved with these projects. And then below that, we also have the jurisdictions, Wayne County's leading in Michigan with St. Clair, not too far behind. And then the cost of the financing in each county. So that's pretty much lean and green. And it's a great resource to go to that website. And I'm gonna finish up with three or four slides on uh, some projects. And um, I was surprised I was able to find PACE projects that are also lead buildings. So the lead community is starting to realize that, hey, why don't we get involved in trying to get this cheaper financing for buildings with uh, nothing up front, non-recourse money. Um, again, it's, uh, it's pretty equitable, pretty reasonable type of financing for both the building owner 
and the developer who want to use this type of financing. But this is called Citizen M. It's a really, uh, it's from Europe, this uh, hotel company. And it's really a cool building. This is the one in Seattle, because you can see the Seattle um, sky in back. Uh, but um, they're building one in LA with Pace Financing, which is um, pretty new and interesting. And I think uh, it's a $15 million project with four or 5 million of Pace. Wrong way. This is a building that's a really cool. This was the DC United Audi field in uh, Washington, DC, state of the art green stadium. They went lead gold and out of $300 million, 25 million of it was PACE financing. So instead of bringing in more expensive mezzanine finance or partners, private equity, you go with PACE financing, it's between five and 6% right now. If you go to the mezzanine or private equity, it's more than double that and a lot more covenants, a lot more restrictions. What's cool about PACE is you can refinance with it and you can sell with it still on your property. It's nothing different than a sewer assessment or a sidewalk assessment. Just like you as a private owner has a sidewalk assessment, if uh, they improved your sidewalks, you can sell that house to the next yeah. owner. He just picks up that assessment and keeps paying of it until it's paid off. This is a, a very cool uh, PACE project. Uh, I should say lead project that use PACE because we're all talking about lead, uh, but they use PACE financing for it. And um, my notes say that um, they used uh, about $20 million of PACE financing. Uh, and um, what I wanted you to know is in California, you can use PACE for seismic measures, improving your building for earthquake prevention. And that's unique in California. In Florida, you can do that for um, hurricane proofing your, your home or your commercial building. And this is the last slide I have, $7 million of energy efficiency projects. Uh, Fiddler's Green is a uh, project in Greenwood Village, Colorado. Colorado is really big on pace. Uh, they do a lot of cool projects. Uh, this is a uh, pursuing lead certification, replacing water fixtures, uh, installing uh, next generation uh, tenant spaces and um, Obviously, uh, you can do uh, active energy management programs. PACE, again, is for anything that's energy, water, or renewable related in your building. And I didn't keep to my 10 minute uh, thing, but Harry gave me a little bit of leeway. So I appreciate that, um, okay. Dr. No, Amari. Hey, yeah. um, no, very I much appreciate um, mm -hmm. bringing the, uh, the, the group home. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it, Bob. And thank you, everyone, uh, all the panelists and all our audience uh, for taking part in this uh, presentation. And as I said, I mean, the, the questions that we had uh, weren't uh, so much of uh, bringing a discussion up, except I think the last question that was asked uh, from Julie, I don't know, Julie was trying to respond to it. Do you have a response to that, Julie? Do you, do you work with PACE uh, in Royal Oak or have you seen it before? Um, I'm typing the response right now, but I'd be happy to say it also. Mm -hmm. So uh, Royal Oak has been uh, qualified to do PACE prep uh, projects since about 2014 or 2015 is my understanding, uh, mm -hmm. but we haven't had one PACE project uh, occur yet. And um, this just came up a few weeks ago, again, because of all of the work that we're doing and recognizing the commercial uh, opportunities and the industrial opportunities. So um, uh, we talked with one of the commissioners and she is uh, very excited to help us move this forward and get the word out. So I think the answer, the answer right now is no, but coming up the answer will be yes. Yes, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Great opportunities there. Uh, it's time for everybody to turn on their cams and mics if they want to uh, ask any certain questions or just show uh, their faces and say hi to our panelists. So this, this is the time that uh, we usually allow for everybody to kind of jump on uh, the Zoom call if they wish to kind of uh, uh, participate in the meeting. But uh, it was very good meeting for me. I mean, I know that we've been working on this thing since last uh, uh, November or December in the education committee of USGBC. And uh, everybody did a great job of bringing all these uh, 
different topics and aspects of the lead project. So we pretty much did most of our discussions before that's, that ended up to be this meeting where we did our presentation. So that's why you don't see us arguing or discussing different aspects of lead because we already made those discussions and came to this conclusion to say, these are the topics that we're gonna cover. These are the main ideas that we wish to present in this meeting to inform uh, whoever is interested in the topic of lead. Uh, for the AEC, the architect, engineering, and construction uh, industry. So I'd like to thank all of you guys. If there's any uh, final notes or comments, Lana, did you have something to say at the end of this program? Um, yeah, just thank you to all the presenters. I think it was a lot of great information. Hopefully you will walk away knowing that we have tools and resources to help you with your sustainability goals. So just reach out, let us know how we can help you with your efforts. And um, I think we all have the same goal. We all want a better future. We all want you know, a healthy future. So um, we're just happy to work together with you. And, and again, great. Harry, thank you so much to you and PMI for organizing this and giving thank us the you. opportunity Appreciate to share it. the information. And the great thing about our programs is that we record them and we cut it in pieces so you can share it with your audience and your own uh, network and uh, people can come back to these topics. I know we covered a lot of different topics and uh, subjects and informative information that uh, really need some time to digest. So I'm sure that people are going to go back to it and kind of reference to these videos and clips in future. And as I mentioned, it's uh, being broadcast live at the same time. So some of our audience were online and they were following us online. But uh, hopefully this is the start of future discussions. And if you have other discussions in other parts, just let us know and then we'll communicate it with our audience as well. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Harry, for Thank putting you. this together. It's been my pleasure to participate. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Harry. Other participants as well. Sure. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Good night. Great job, Thank everyone. You. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Appreciate Bye. it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.